There's more of what the past. And what I would contrast this with is the dredge scenario with what we're doing is just deepening the active channel. In this case, that I show here, the, the, the active channel is designed to transport sediment and to not be unstable. The, most of the volume during a flood is conveyed up here. And by increasing the capacity of that area to convey flows, we can have a stable channel that conveys a lot more water. Uh, the problem, or the, the, the challenge that we have is there's some houses in that area. And, and it's, and it's fine. That, <laughs> so what we attempt to do with our model is finding a balance between the houses that would have to be relocated and a scenario where where there's some homes that don't get flooded. But aren't there a lot of pre-existing flooded out houses in the top of that to 12 where they already were gone? And then they just need a lot of 12. They're already gone. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. When, when you show that widening of the channel, what side of the channel is that on? Well, I'll show you on the next slide. This is just sort of an artist rendition. This does not really represent my uh, trail. Okay, my trail can handle water coming over it. It doesn't bother me. Right. Yeah. The so the, so the, the bike trail area, or whatever you might call it, is normally dry. Right. Other than that, one day every year, every two years, right. where there's a flood and then water is on, on, on that area. And so you, you can't build structures there. You can have walking trails there. You can have a backyard there. But you don't want to build homes there. It's flooded frequently. Or shed. Or shed. Yeah, anything that's going to get carried away and washed out. Because I was very interested, I missed you last week, about the river walk in Phoenicia. That seemed to be exactly the same thing. Yeah, and I didn't have these slides at that time because I, I felt like I wasn't quite conveying the idea, so I put together these four slides to right. show it. Because that would really be great. And 98% of the time, people could walk along, whatever it is, but it would have to completely handle too much water, wipe it out, and then come back in the nice. yeah. So what would do that? It's not concrete. What is this bikeway made out of that you, your artist rendition? How does that work? The trick of these is to develop a channel, a floodway, during flood conditions channel, that's wide enough and the model helps us look at the velocities so that the velocities go down because the area gets widened. And we actually um, model what kind of surface will not get ripped up and chewed away. Yes. If you can get velocities down to you know eight to ten feet per second, it's not going to rip it up. If it's eighteen feet per second, you're just going to start getting a lot of erosion. So the beauty of the model is that it can tell us not only how deep the water will be and where the water will be, but how fast it is moving, and that helps us design the right thing. The right. And sometimes it needs to be. Um, don't. I mean, sometimes it's because the velocities are higher in some places, we need to be a little more robust and more put there. Um, good question. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how many houses are set? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's day two. Yeah, and, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's kind of two pieces of bad news, not to jump ahead too far. Okay. One is that there's a lot of houses close to the channel in this case, and that's part of the reason I showed you the, the floodway at the beginning. Also, uh, that area really floods extensively. And I'll show you the results in the modeling. But even building this, we don't, I'm giving away these, one of my answers here, but we don't take 100% of the water off. We're still, we, we can't completely eliminate the flood. We can only reduce it. And in some cases, we, in other areas we've worked, we are able to contain the flood within that channel. But in this case, it's a lot of water in a very big area. But I'll, I'll, I'll go through the results. Did you have a question? I did. I need to hear my head a little bit, but I'm starting to hear hints of turning currently a private land into public land. Hold on. Because the, uh, I think we need to go through yeah. that. Yeah. Go through that scenario. And let me say one thing that I should have said at the beginning. I said everything, nothing that we're presenting here is going to be imposed on anybody. It's a community process. And we are presenting alternatives for everyone's consideration. There's no forced buyouts or eminent domain or anything like that being presented. Yes. 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 Sorry. Has it been done before? Yes. 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 Yes.
house and yeah. 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 In fact, we're, we are currently designing something like this in, in German class, which is in Herkimer County, and uh, we are, not, not to go too much off track, but Janine and I grew up in a town, <laughs> Meriden, Connecticut, just by coincidence. We both grew up in this town. We both worked on a flood project in Meriden in the... In the 1990s, because yeah. I was very pregnant with my now 18-year-old daughter at the time. Um, and that had challenges that were very different from yours, but among them was uh, probably a third of a mile of this brook was actually in an underground conduit um, through a parking lot of what was the 1970s version of our shopping mall. And it was extremely expensive. We looked at four miles of, of stream. We looked at lots and lots. 27 bridges, some railroad bridges mostly, uh, they were um, roadway bridges, and we looked at a ton of alternatives, and many of the pieces have actually been implemented, but the, the most exciting one is that third of a mile of conduit has been unearthed, and I can't even recall how many cubic yards of material is coming out of what was this old mall area now is going to be a town park and amphitheater, and we actually have a stream now going through this downtown where we grew up, um, very urban area of, of a city of about 50,000 people. Um, so in 18 years, you can't even imagine, went by in a blink, but it actually, I mean, this is, I remember when I was a kid, um, a little older than Mark, but there was a movie theater, and one of the floods that happened in the 1980s had flooding up to the seventh row of the movie theaters. And this area was decimated many, many, many millions of dollars of, of uh, damage. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's worked in a lot of places. And that might not be the best. I just thought of that, that one. It's urban. We're not urban here, and that was under a mall. But, yes, it's, it has been designed and has worked in, in and, other places. And I have to say, we never know what we're getting into when we start looking at this. We don't know what the model is going to tell us. We really don't. This is a very, very challenging Mark will go through and we've looked at the width safari. We've explored as many options as we can think of. And some have some promise and some some do not. But this is a very, very challenging area. And if there's a silver lining in some of the things that don't work, information and knowledge is is very powerful. And I think it's just as important to know what you ought not spend your money on because it will not help you as what what you might spend your money on, public money, federal money, anyway, that that could work. And I think the worst of all scenarios is when you do something that's flood protection and you have this false sense of security that this is going to fix the flood until the next flood comes, and it doesn't. So, I mean, not all of the news we have to share tonight is positive, good news, um, but I, I think at the end of the day, we have good information that you can then make your own decisions on. Um, and, and there is no plan to take people's homes for the greater good of the community. This is where we leave you with the information to then evaluate things for yourself. Have you done modeling in um, watershed communities where there's a high degree of rainfall, such as we experience here, precipitation over a year? Um, Yeah, that, uh, that, 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 this, that this, these uh, uh, projects have been implemented in a situation like that? We have, and we typically look at the most devastating, typically the 100-year flow, sometimes the 500-year flow, but we, yes. We and the hydrology <coughs> that we put into our model accounts <coughs> for the high yeah. precipitation well, what, um, area okay. catastrophes. Because, yeah. um, you know, um,
up everything. And um, I was just wondering, you know, if it's not flooding, the amount of water that's coming through this area uh, over the course of time. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and it, it, it just takes a, a bank for that to reshape the channel and move sediment around it. So certainly, if, you know, um, that, that, that would affect the shape of the channel. Fortunately, our model, we have very recent hydraulic, you know, the, the hydraulic modeling takes into account the shape of the channel. And, and sometimes in other areas where we've done studies, the modeling can be a bit dated and the channel could have changed shape over time, which I think you're suggesting. In this case, we have very recent post-Irene uh, modeling. So, and hydrology. So yeah, the hydrology. Hydrology is, is how much water falls down, which is what you're, and then the hydrology is, and how does that water move through? So let me move ahead here. So. This is what we tested in the model. Uh, and the red areas represent these, these sort of floodplain enhancement areas that I described in, in those cross-section slides. So, you know, it's the inside of the bend. Uh, and by excavating out this area and this area, uh, we can prevent flooding here and here. And that, that was sort of the hypothesis. And then we ran the model, and I will show you some of those results. Now, in this particular scenario, there, it requires the relocation of 14 homes along Risey Road. Show us that. Where? Where? And, and in this area. Ah. Anywhere that's in red is this floodplain enhancement area I described in the excavation. It would also require the removal of the, the, old, bridge. the old bridge, because otherwise it would be a bridge to nowhere. Yeah. Why don't you just move that red line over a little bit on the other side of the dike, dig out and save those homes that are along the Mount Pleasant Road? That, that red, uh, yes. red area that you're going to uh, yeah. you know, dig out, just move it over further here to that. This way? Oh, that way? Oh, this, this is the active channel. That one, that, okay, cool. that's already empty. Yeah. Yeah, I've this. seen that mountain grow over the years. Yeah. Uh, the, the one on the, the big one and then the one by the bridge. They, they've grown yeah. considerably over yeah. the decades. Yeah. Yeah. And that earlier model, the dredge scenario, we've all taken those out. And in this case, I mean, the, the, the red is meant to be sort of a, an illustration of where that floodplain enhancement was. It, it would involve reshaping, you know, the, uh, the uh, the area where the channel connects to the floodplain. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the dike would be gone. Right. Yeah. You know, dike. Where's the other side of this? Right here. Ah. Uh, yeah, just out of range. Eighty cents. Okay. Yeah. Just, and here's the beaver kill coming in. And here's two twelve coming down. Now, now if someone asked about this twenty eight bridge. Uh, we modeled this floodplain enhancement scenario in combination with and without the replacement of this bridge with a larger structure. Because what we found is this bridge backs up flood, flood waters. Uh, so I'll, I'll step through just the floodplain enhancement, just the bridge replacement, and then the two combined. But all of them involve the removal of this bridge. So, uh, and so this is just a, a few shots of the Route 28 bridge. And, we found early on in our modeling that bring bigger floods, the water does back up behind that bridge and extend upstream, and, and uh, you'll see that in some of my uh, the profiles. Now, I know there's a lot of information on this slide, but, but basically, the four lines point to four different conditions. And again, we have the, the channel coming down like this, the Mount Pleasant Bridge is gone, here's the Route 28 bridge, the red line, this is the 100 year flood. The red line it represents existing conditions. The darker green line represents the floodplain enhancement scenario by itself. So you can see there's some reduction in flooding. The blue line represents no floodplain enhancement scenario. But with the Route 28 bridge, I will remove there, but really it's removed and replaced with a larger structure that doesn't. Uh, and then this bottom green line is both the floodplain enhancement 
and the Route 28 bridge being replaced. And I'll put some numbers here at the sort of water surface elevation reductions at the sea. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of numbers I can put on here, but just to summarize it, the best water surface ele elevation reduction is when we do both. The replace the bridge and do the floodplain enhancement scenario, and we see almost a seven foot reduction uh, compared to the existing conditions, just upstream of the bridge, and then that benefit sort of diminishes as you go upstream. But you still see a three foot reduction in this area, and I'll, uh, what I'll show you next is some depth here mapping that sort of the colors illustrates what sort of reduction in flooding we see under those. So, I know it's a bit like a tie-dye t-shirt, but the, the blue represents the deepest water, and the red represents shallow water. This is what the area would look like in a 100-year flood. So the deepest water is in the channel, and you have shallower water out in this area. Now I'm going to click this forward, and it's the, the, the changes in color, you can see they get darker red, which means the water is shallower. This is by replacing the bridge. And you see a three and a half foot reduction immediately upstream of the bridge, but then that reduction sort of diminishes as you go upstream, and by the time you're up about where the beaver kill is, it's less than half a foot in the 100 year flood. So as you top of that, so you can see, you see things get redder. Now, this is the floodplain enhancement scenario by itself without replacing the bridge. You see about a three and a half foot reduction in the area of the bridge. You see about just over a foot where uh, the Mount Pleasant Bridge was. It'll be removed. And about a foot and a half and 1.8 feet sort of through this bend. So I'll just talk about it. You can see again, some areas in this area actually are removed from flooding. But for the most part, the flooding is just getting shallow. It's not going away. And this is the combination of the floodplain enhancement and the replacement of the bridge. And now you see some pretty big reductions, almost seven feet <laughs> at the bridge. 3.7 feet just downstream of the bridge because you have the floodplain enhancement on this bank. And then five feet, three feet, two feet. It sounds like a lot, but when you look at the depth grid mapping, you see flooding is reduced, but it still occurs in a 100 year flood. It doesn't get the flooding off the inside of that bed, where a lot of homes occur. So, during a 10-year flood, we see measurable benefit from the floodplain enhancement, but not very much benefit from the bridge replacement. In the big flood, like the 100-year flood, the best benefit is from a combination of the two. Um, and it reduces, but doesn't eliminate flooding. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go through this as part of our cost-benefit analysis as well. Now I just want to quickly cover two scenarios that are on the beaver kill, the tributary that comes in there. You can see by the, the green map, the light green line here, how the flooding, this is the beaver kill coming down and then down into uh, the sofas. The same sort of floodplain enhancement scenario we modeled here. In order to try and get this flooding from crossing the road and flooding some homes on this side, it's a much smaller version than what I showed you. Uh, out on the main Silvis. And what we see is the same sort of profile. We see about half a foot in the 10 year flood. We see about a foot and a half in the 100 year flood. <coughs> this is existing conditions on the Beaver Kill. And you can see the reduction there, how it reduces the amount of water on the road, but it doesn't eliminate it entirely. Yeah. Um, I sharp bend and the water just banged into the bank, cut away underneath and washed the two lanes of the road away. Yes. Um, you're, it looks like you're not dealing with that area at all. No, there's a little building to the bottom. Was there? The correct when you, when you repaired there? Yeah, you got to see the rock from the curb. Okay. Well, when we do our, our field inventory, we look for areas that have potential it would require a really extensive amount of excavation. We're looking for areas that are somewhat low-lying anyways that we can 
enhanced, because it's always, you'll see as I go through the benefit cost analysis, if we, uh, the excavation is a big cost factor. And if we're excavating off the material, it quickly becomes not cost effective. So that was, that was weighed in here. We, as we looked at the channels, we were looking for areas that had potential. Uh, so another area, and this is the last scenario that we looked at, was the Plank Road Bridge here. I know it has, I think it goes by several names. I've been calling it the Plank Road Bridge, uh, which is right here, uh, crossing the Beaver Kill. We know that water backs up behind it and actually overtops it during big floods sort of does an end run around it. Uh, again, the 10-year flood, no big deal, but in the 100-year flood, this line represents existing conditions. And when we enlarge the bridge, you can see how it, it stops acting as a dam. And you see almost a five-foot reduction. And we did the depth grid mapping here, so this is uh, the existing conditions. And you can see when we replace that bridge with a bigger structure, there's, there's a substantial reduction here. We get the water off this intersection and it reduces flooding at a home that's right there. So both of those scenarios we, we brought through the, the benefit cost analysis. Can I ask you, this, if they just like, well, then if you're doing that, you're letting that much more water back into the soaker, it's going to cause more problems than the next potential. Yeah, well, I know, I know and there is a potential for a bridge to back up water and store it, and, but essentially, in the larger scheme, that doesn't amount to further flooding. I don't mean just the bridge, I mean just that if you're, if you're eliminating a lot of the flooding there, yeah. that means it's staying in the, in the stream, and that stream is letting into the soaps. I mean, I wonder if that's all part of it. I guess it is. It doesn't, the, the bridge back up doesn't act as a core present. I wasn't talking about that. It just acts as a reverse trigger. It's not as a safety call with no flooding. So it's not acting as like a battery of the whole water. I guess it's a little hard to picture how each of the little suggestions um, increase or reduce flooding farther down. Yeah, no, and what, it's hard that, to that picture. Case, like a bridge, what we're looking at is flooding up, just upstream of the bridge, because the bridge is acting as a constriction, right. and backing up water almost like a dam, and flooding homes upstream of the bridge. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have an impact if we were to upsize the bridge on flooding on homes downstream. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's it. Yes. And that's a good point because I'm going to cover, I'm going to go into the benefit cost analysis now. And, and you see some things that are not, they don't, they don't measure up to a, a one for a benefit cost analysis, which means you know, you probably get funded. But nonetheless, it identifies the fact that that bridge is undersized and it ought to be, next time it's replaced or next time it comes up, it ought to be replaced with a bigger structure. Uh, as part of the process, and, and even if even if we can't justify it for flood mitigation purposes. Yeah, I thought they just finished working on that bridge. Didn't they work on that just recently? Yeah, they just replaced that. Yeah. Place to that <laughs> so I'm just going to here's the list that we started with, and these uh, are the alternatives that were rolled out for the reasons I explained. And then these ones were some combination of them we took through the benefit cost analysis. Uh, you know, we didn't do a benefit cost analysis of the Mount Pleasant bridge removal, but it's part of the other alternatives of floodplain enhancement scenarios. So I'm just going to step through this benefit cost analysis now for the for the where you see the green checks. And basically what a benefit cost analysis is, we just we determine the benefits that result from the reductions in flooding and actually put a monetary value on that over a 50 year time span. And then what are the costs for building that project? And it's a benefit, it's just a, a ratio of benefit to cost. And what we want is for the benefits to outweigh the cost. Yeah. And these are just some examples of costs and benefits. Uh, you know, uh, if we're relocating homes and businesses, there's a cost of that. It's based on assessed value. And the if, if you're dredging or if you're creating these floodplain enhancement scenarios, you've got to export material. And there's a whole list of considerations when you're coming up with costs. And then benefits are, as I said, either the reduction in flooding or the benefit of having relocated a home out of harm's way 
Uh, and in scenarios such as a floodplain enhancement, there could be benefits that you could put in because of, of open space and, and riparian areas. So this is the dredge scenario. And again, it's a 50-year time span. If we look at the benefits, due to flood water reduction, over 50 years, it's close to $2.4 million. The one-time sediment removal of the, uh, of the volume of sediment is about 1.7 million, and our estimation is that it would have to be repeated five times during a 50-year time span, which is almost $9 million. And that gives us a benefit-cost ratio of just under 0.3. Well, we have an estimate, uh, estimate of what it, even if you sold it, it's still probably going to cost you at least $20 a cubic yard to, for equipment use, for uh, permits, for mobilization, for dewatering. There's a lot of costs associated with getting the material out of the channel. And yes, those costs would be offset by reusing it. Although, just as a reality check, we, we took out 130,000 cubic yards of material from a drinking water supply reservoir. Um, the material was usable and was used by, um, by the contractor. And he actually, in his price, had the, the benefit of reusing the material, and it was just about $3 million. So it was, that, that was with the, the sale of the material. Depending on what it is, if it's beautiful sand and gravel, you can get more money than if it has slaves and silver in it. But this is a very large volume, as you saw in the calculations. Uh, this is the floodplain scenario. Uh, we have about $25 million worth of benefits. That's a reduction in damages to homes, either because they've been relocated or because the flood is contained, the, the flood elevations are reduced. We look at the cost of constructing that type of project, and that's a combination of property relocations uh, and removing the Mount Pleasant Bridge and constructing this floodplain, and it's about over $50 million. But it does give us a positive benefit to cost ratio over a 50 year time span. That was the floodplain enhancement without the bridge. Now, here's the bridge by itself, and we see $1.2 million in benefit from a bigger bridge. However, that cost of replacing that bridge, because they have to stand not just the channel, but the floodplain in order to function. Uh, I worked with one of our structural engineers on this, and he put it at $50 million. And clearly, that's a low benefit yeah. cost ratio. But now let's look at the combination of the floodplain and the Route 28 bridge being replaced with a larger structure. Our benefits are a little bit higher than they were with just the floodplain scenario, it's about 26.6 million. The cost, because we're adding in the bridge replacement, are 30 million dollars, but the benefit cost ratio is, it's not one, but it's not terrible. Uh, there may be ways to bring it up closer, refining estimates, doing more investigation. So that one's not completely out of the park. We look at the replacement of the Plank Road Bridge. The benefits are fairly minimal because it, it, it didn't affect that many homes. And there's, assuming a, a, a truss style bridge that was larger than the one that was before, this is, this is our estimate, and it's fairly low benefit to cost ratio. But again, as I said earlier, when that bridge needs to be replaced, due to this analysis, we know that it's undersized, we know that it's causing some flooding, 